Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases, especially written, for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Brian Lynn and Anna Mateo. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first... Rescue workers confirmed on Monday that at least 60 people are dead after a dam collapsed in Minas Gerais State in Brazil. Officials say at least 300 other people remain missing. The dam, owned by Brazil's Vale Mining Company, collapsed Friday in the town of Brumaginho. Water and mud swept over hundreds of mine workers as they were taking a lunch break. Search efforts continued on Monday. Rescue workers used long pieces of wood to cross mud-covered areas to search for bodies inside of a bus. Villagers discovered the bus as they tried to rescue a nearby cow that was stuck in the mud. Ajimi Rogerio lives in Brumaginho. He cried as he looked at the mud where Vale's facilities once stood on the edge of town. He told the Reuters news service, The world is over for us. Vale is the top mining company in the world. If this could happen here, imagine what would happen if it were a smaller mine. Brazil's top prosecutor, Raquel Dodge, said Vale should be held responsible and criminally prosecuted. She added that executives working there could also be personally held responsible. Reaction to the disaster could threaten the plans of new Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro. He wants to reduce restrictions on the mining industry and has proposed opening up indigenous land areas and parts of the Amazon rainforest for mining. Four years ago, another mining dam broke in the state of Minas Gerais. Nineteen people were killed. That dam was controlled by Vale, as well as Australian mining company BHP Billiton. The 2015 dam collapse released millions of tons of deadly iron waste along hundreds of kilometers. It caused what is considered Brazil's worst ever environmental disaster. The United States official working to bring peace to Afghanistan says significant progress was made during his latest talks with the Taliban. U.S. Special Representative Zalmay Khalilzad reported the progress after holding six days of talks with Taliban representatives in Qatar. Before going to Qatar, Khalilzad met with Afghan government officials. Meetings here were more productive than they have been in the past, Khalilzad wrote on Twitter as he prepared to fly back to Afghanistan. 
He added, we will build on the momentum and resume talks shortly. We have a number of issues left to work out. The goal of the talks is to reach a peace deal agreed to by all sides. The U.S.-led Afghan war was launched shortly after the September 11, 2001 attacks on the United States. The military action was aimed at ousting the Taliban from power. U.S. officials accused the group's leaders of providing support to al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden and his followers. Khalil Zad met in Kabul Sunday with Afghan President Ashraf Ghani. In a statement, the President's office said the U.S. diplomat had shared details about his talks with the Taliban. It said Khalil Zad held discussions with the Taliban on a ceasefire, but that he reported no specific progress on the issue. Khalil Zad wrote on Twitter Saturday that any agreement must include details relating to a comprehensive ceasefire. The New York Times reported him as saying a peace deal could lead to a full pullout of U.S. troops in exchange for a ceasefire and Taliban talks with the Afghan government. Taliban fighters have been carrying out near-daily attacks on Afghan security forces. President Ghani said last week that about 45,000 security force members had been killed since he took office in 2014. The Taliban currently controls about half the country's territory. Ghani spoke about the peace talks in a message to the Afghan people Monday. Our commitment is to provide peace and to prevent any possible disaster, he said. The president added that any peace agreement should respect the government's national unity and national sovereignty. During his address, Ghani noted that U.S. and other foreign forces remain in the country because they are still needed. He said if there is to be any force reductions or pullout, the Afghan government will have to be involved in those discussions. He also repeated a call to the Taliban to agree to hold direct talks with the Afghan government. The U.S. military has about 14,000 troops in Afghanistan. About 8,000 troops from 38 other countries are also involved in the effort which is largely directed against Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. I'm Brian Lynn. From VOA Learning English, this is the Health and Lifestyle Report. If you are like millions of people around the world, the new year brings with it new goals. Perhaps you want to save money, lose weight, or learn a new skill. You tell yourself, this is the year I'm going to fill in the blank. But then you get busy. Your daily life, as wonderful as it can be, takes up all of your time. 
Before you know it, weeks, then months have gone by, and you are no closer to your goal. Time, as they say, waits for no one. Yet your goal remains important, and achieving a goal, no matter how small, feels good. In addition, when we do not work on our goals, we may end up feeling guilty or not successful. So, how can we find time to work on these larger life goals? Well, many websites address this issue, and they offer some of the same advice. If you want to achieve something, clearly identify it and write it down. As you identify your goals, be specific. If a goal is too general, it may be hard to pursue, let alone achieve it. Let's say your goal is to get in better physical shape. That's a fine idea, but psychologists might say as a goal, it is too general. To make the goal more specific, you could sign up for a regular exercise class. So, whether you are dancing, doing yoga, or kickboxing, you have a regular commitment every week. You could also say your goal is to lose a certain amount of weight in a certain amount of time. Experts say writing down your goal is a very important step. It gets the goal out of your brain and into the real world. Some psychologists suggest that writing a goal on paper is better than typing it on a device or saying it into your phone. Your brain receives information differently when it comes from handwriting. Writing things down seems to say to the brain, I am important, remember me. Writing has another benefit. You can post your goal somewhere as a reminder. As you sit down at your computer or pour your morning coffee, your goal stares you in the face and asks, what are you going to do about me today? Telling someone your goal is also helpful. If someone else knows about your goals, you are held accountable for any progress or lack of progress. Your friend might ask, so how many pages of your novel have you written? If you keep saying none, you might feel badly. Now you feel a pressure to do it, the pressure of your friend's opinion of you. And that can be a big pressure. Many people do not want to let others down, especially friends and family. Not all goals are created equal. Some can be quite big. And for those bigger goals, experts suggest breaking them down into smaller ones. So let's say you want to work for yourself. You love cooking, so you decide to start your own company that supplies food for special events. Now that is a very big goal but it is made up of many smaller goals. So identify them, write them down, and set for yourself time limits. These suggestions all help to make your goals real. If you simply think about your goals, they can easily get lost in your brain, which, after all, has a lot to do in a day. Other experts remind us of another detail as we set our goals for the new year. The goals may change, or your life situation may change, or you may change. So it is a good idea to check in with yourself. Is this goal still what you want? Is your approach still working? If things are not proceeding forward, perhaps you need to change something. One expert, Ryder Carroll, 
helps people organize their life's goals by using a simple notebook. He suggests thinking about your goals not as a final destination, but rather as lighthouses guiding you along. It is the pursuit of your goals, not the reaching of them, that makes up the weeks, days, and hours of our lives. So make sure to have fun along the way. And that's the Health and Lifestyle Report. I'm Ana Mateo. And I'm Brian Lynn. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. One day in October of 1859, Americans were shocked by news of an attack led by John Brown. He was an anti-slavery extremist. Many people also considered him a madman. John Brown had declared that he was ready to die fighting slavery. He said that God wanted him to fight slavery by invading Virginia with a military force. And even if the rebellion failed, he predicted that it would lead to a civil war between the North and the South. Should there be a war, he said, the North would break the chains of black slaves. Brown decided to strike at Harper's Ferry, a small town about 100 kilometers from Washington. It was part of Virginia at that time, but is now located in the state of West Virginia. It had a factory that made guns for the Army and a supply center of valuable military equipment. Brown wanted the guns and equipment for the slave army he hoped to organize. Harper's Ferry was built on a narrow finger of land where the Shenandoah River flows into the Potomac. There was a bridge across each river. Brown organized his attack from across the Potomac in Maryland. Harry Monroe and Jack Moyles continue the story of John Brown and his raid on Harper's Ferry. With his force of less than 20 men, John Brown moved through the darkness down to the bridge that crossed the Potomac River. Two men left the group to cut the telegraph lines east and west of Harper's Ferry. At the bridge, Brown's men surprised a railroad guard. They told him he was their prisoner. The guard thought they were joking until he saw their guns. Once across the bridge, Brown and his men moved quickly. They captured a few people in the street and another guard at the front gate of the government armory. They seized the armory, then crossed the street and seized the supply center. Millions of dollars' worth of military equipment was kept there. After leaving a few men to guard the prisoners, Brown and the others went to the gun factory across town. They seized the few people who were there and captured the factory. Without firing a shot, Brown now controlled the three places he wanted in Harper's Ferry. His problem now was to hold what he had captured. Brown knew he had little time. The people of the town would soon learn what had happened. They would call for help, and several groups of militia in the area would come to the aid of Harper's Ferry. Brown planned to use the people he had captured as hostages. The militia would not attack if there was danger of harming the prisoners. He wanted as many prisoners as possible to protect himself. If his plan failed, he could offer them in exchange for his own freedom and 
that of his men. Brown had decided to capture as his best hostage Colonel Lewis Washington. The colonel was a descendant of President George Washington. He lived on a big farm near Harper's Ferry. Brown sent some of his men to capture the old colonel and free his slaves. They returned from the Washington farm after midnight. They brought Colonel Washington and ten slaves. They also captured another farmer and his son. The slaves were given spears and told to guard the prisoners. Then, at the far end of the Potomac River Bridge, the first shots were fired. Brown's son, Watson, and another man fired at a railroad guard who refused to halt. A bullet struck his head, but did not hurt him seriously. The guard raced back across the bridge to the railroad station. He cried out that a group of armed men had seized the bridge. A few minutes later, a train from the west arrived at Harper's Ferry. The wounded guard warned the trainmen of the danger at the bridge. Two of the trainmen decided to investigate. They walked toward the bridge. Before they could reach it, bullets began whizzing past them. They ran back to the train and moved it farther from the bridge. Then a free Negro man who worked at the railroad station, Hayward Shepard, walked down to the bridge. Brown's men ordered him to halt. Shepard tried to run and was shot. He got back to the station but died several hours later. Brown finally agreed to let the train pass over the bridge and continue on to Baltimore. The train left at sunrise. By this time, word of Brown's attack had spread to Charlestown, more than 12 kilometers away. Officials called out the militia, ordering the men of Charlestown to get ready to go to the aid of Harper's Ferry. Soon after sunrise, men began arriving at Harper's Ferry from other towns in the area. They took positions above the armory and started shooting at it. The militia from Charlestown arrived at the Maryland end of the Potomac Bridge. They charged across, forcing Brown's men on the bridge to flee to the armory. Only one of Brown's men was hit. He was killed instantly. Brown saw that he was surrounded. His only hope was to try to negotiate a ceasefire and offer to release his 30 hostages if the militia would let him and his men go free. Brown sent out one of his men and one of the prisoners with a white flag. The excited crowd refused to recognize the white flag. They seized Brown's man and carried him away. Brown moved his men and the most important of his hostages into a small brick building at the armory. Then he sent out two more of his men with a prisoner to try to negotiate a ceasefire. One of them was his son, Watson. This time, the crowd opened fire. Watson and the other raider were wounded. Their prisoner escaped to safety. Watson was able to crawl back to the armory. One of the youngest of Brown's men, William Lehman, tried to escape. 
He ran from the armory and jumped into the Potomac, planning to swim across the river. He did not get far. A group of militia saw him and began shooting. Lehman was forced to hide behind a rock in the middle of the river. Two men went out to the rock with guns and shot him. His body lay in the river for two days. Later, more people were killed. One was the mayor of Harper's Ferry, Fontaine Beckham. After the mayor's death, a mob went to the hotel where one of Brown's men had been held since he was seized earlier in the day. They pulled him from the hotel and took him to the bridge over the river. Several members of the mob put guns to his head and fired. They pushed his body off the bridge and into the water. Across town, three of Brown's men were in trouble at the gun factory. The factory was built on an island in the Shenandoah River. The island was now surrounded by militia. Forty of the soldiers attacked the factory from three sides. They pushed the three raiders back to a small building next to the river. The three men fought as long as possible. Then they jumped through a window into the river. They tried to swim to safety. Men with guns were waiting for them. Bullets fell around the three like rain. One man was hit. He died instantly. Another was wounded. He was pulled to land and left to die. The third man escaped death. He was captured and held for trial. Through the afternoon and evening, Brown's men at the armory continued to exchange shots with the militia. Several more on both sides were killed or wounded. One of those was another of Brown's sons, Oliver. He was shot and seriously wounded. Night fell. Then a militia officer, Captain Sin, walked up to the small building held by Brown. He shouted to the men inside that he wished to talk. Brown opened the door and let him in. For almost an hour, the two men talked. They talked about slavery and the right to rebel against the government. Brown was furious that the crowd outside had refused to honor his white flag of truce earlier in the day. He told Sin that his men could have killed unarmed men and women, but did not do so. That is not quite correct, Captain Sin said. Mayor Beckham had no gun when he was shot. Then I can only say I am most sad to hear it, said Brown. Men who take up guns against the government, said Sin, must expect to be shot down like dogs. In Washington, President Buchanan and Secretary of War John Floyd did not learn of the rebellion at Harper's Ferry until after ten o'clock that morning. The president wanted immediate action. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.